the offering, I just asked Easter if she would share a little bit, uh, especially since tomorrow's uh, Dr. Martin Luther King national holiday, but she has a pretty amazing perspective on all this because of her own life history that some of you might not know. So before we received the offering, I just wanted Easter to share a little bit. Martin Luther King Jr. He was an amazing person. As I was just researching and looking up, you know, different things in different places. Um, just, just an amazing person. So the scripture that the Lord gave me pertaining to um, pertaining to this is Proverbs 14, 31. And I pray that it resounds throughout what I say. Insult your creator, will you? That's exactly what you do every time that you oppress the powerless. Showing kindness to the poor is equal to honoring your maker. So, as we come today to uh, celebrate the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we are not worshiping him, but we are recognizing how the Lord used a person to shift a society. That's right. So where do we begin? We could talk about Dr. King entering Morehouse College at the age of 15 and graduating at 19. We could talk about him getting a B.S. in divinity at the age of, I think he was uh, 22 or so. But he went on to Boston University and received a Ph.D. at the age of 26. Now, when he was young, when he was little, um, he loved words so much so that he would read the dictionary. And it comes out in his speaking. So, uh, Dr. King, let's take a peek, a little peek into Dr. King's earlier life, which I see as pivotal to his absolute passion for justice for all people. When he was young, a neighbor stopped Martin from playing with their uh, child. It was a white couple. They had a business across the street. And Martin and this little boy used to play together all the time. Children don't see like adults, right? So when they were six years old, they went to different schools because of segregation. The mother said to Martin, we are white and you are colored and my son cannot play with you again. At six years old, Martin determined to hate white people, but his parents taught him that it was his Christian duty to love everyone. Martin experienced many things with his dad that shaped his view of, of choosing justice and equity. He saw a couple of experiences where his father was treated and maligned as a boy. You know, like, get over there, boy. And you cannot shop over here because colored people go over here. So all of these things kind of shaped Martin's heart. In 1934, uh, Martin's father was sent on a multi-nation trip that ended in Berlin, Germany. The visit, he was visiting the sites of the Protestant Reformation. And he saw some things and heard some things 
that shifted his heart about how to deal with all people because uh, in that place they were looking at people as people not based on color not based on ethnicity or whatever it was just they were people and so he came home and began to tell people to call him Martin Martin Luther from the Protestant Reformation you see how powerfully what he saw there impacted him and he had enough fortitude to change his name not only his name he had Martin Luther King Jr.'s name changed from what it was, which both their names were Michael, changed it on his birth certificate to Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> I thought that was profound. And Martin was 24, 25 years old when his name was changed. So, and it was interesting to me as I was reading about the, the father going to Germany in 1934. And that's when a lot of that Aryan stuff about race was kicked up over there. Well, the ne in the next two years, 1936, Jesse Owens went to the Olympics and won four gold medals. <laughs> so I think uh, Hitler's view of of black people changed around that time I'm not sure but I want to um, proceed with um, the Gettysburg Address now this is something that I learned by heart in school but I don't remember it all I just remember the first part but uh, this is this is Abraham Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address Four score and seven years, which is 87 years. I, I was shocked by that. It was only 87 years after the 1776, you know, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and all of that. It was 87 years. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. Conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that land as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives, that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to, uh, it is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they were of which they here gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, yeah. that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that this government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. A hundred years or so before uh, uh, Martin Luther King. On August the 28th, 1963, some hundred years after President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing the slaves, a young man named Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. climbed the marble steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. to describe his vision of America.
I'm just going to read some portions of his speech. 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still badly crippled by the monocles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. This man has such a mastery of the language yeah. and how he put things together. Yeah. It, it is just so awesome. That's the gift of God in him. And God wants all of us to use the gift that he's placed in us in this day, in this hour. America, he said, has given the Negro people a bad check. A check which has come back marked insufficient funds. Have you ever gotten an insufficient funds like from your bank where you didn't have enough money to cash the check? This is what he's saying. There was a bad check uh, given. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. Amen. Hallelujah. God is the God of justice. His throne is built on righteousness and justice. He says, now is the time to make the real promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. And he's talking to the black people then. He said, don't be drunk off of bitterness. Don't drink that cup. God is love. There are those who are asking, he said, the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We are not satisfied and will not be satisfied until what? Justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. That's Amos 524. Right. This will be the day, he said, when all of God's people all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tears of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside let freedom ring. Amen. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. Now, I'm not going to keep continue there, but I want you to know what came, what came out of the march on Washington. It was, the, it was the catalyst that pushed forth a couple of bills that had been trying to go through and trying to go through and trying to go through. But those 250,000 people on the Washington Mall and the speech that Martin Luther gave convinced hearts in America, convinced the Congress and the Senate, let's look at this. So the Civil Rights Act was, the Civil Rights Act was signed into law by President Johnson at the White House on July 2nd, 1964. From that, Dr. King receives the Nobel Peace Prize in December 10th of 1964 for his leadership and, and especially advocating nonviolence. The next bill that was signed was the Voting Acts Right. And isn't it interesting that all of the hullabaloo now is about voting, but it's, it's talking about illegitimate votes. But this Voting Act gave people the right to vote uh, without a whole bunch of, of uh, Jim Crow type activity. President Johnson signed this Voting Rights Act into law on August the 6th, 1965. How Dr. King's life influenced my life. I grew up in Alabama. To, uh, my father was a sharecropper. My mother was a uh, stay at home, but we all worked. Do you hear me? We worked. <laughs> 
on a farm, everyone works. Um, I went to a segregated high school. I graduated in 1962, so you can calculate my age if you choose. <laughs> anyway, um, I had a teacher who saw something in me. And even though she didn't speak prophetically, you know, people still prophesy over you without saying it's a prophetic word. So what she said was, Easter, I see that you have the ability and the mind and the capacity to go to college. I had no idea about going to college. I'm graduating high school with like no idea, right? Anyway, she helped me with my applications and stuff. And so I entered Tuskegee University, um, uh, major, <laughs> majored in biology. I was on a five-year plan. It takes most people five years now anyway, but it was a work and go to class, work and go to class. So it, it was a five, called the five-year plan and it was a campus-wide, anyone who didn't have the means to pay their tuition uh, and qualified could be a part of that program. I was thankful. God had made a way. My parents would not have been able to pay my tuition. They barely could get me down to the college, which was about, I'd say, two hours from home. So every time I came home to go back, we had to hire somebody to take me. So I, I did graduate valedictorian of my high school. And the title of my speech was Stake Your Claim. It's never too late to stake your claim. Never too late. Never too late to stake your claim. So I, I was at Tuskegee, and then May, uh, May 31st for the commencement, guess who was our speaker? Dr. Martin Luther King. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, um, I, um, Majoring in biology, as I said, I stayed on and received a master's degree. And along that time, after the Civil Rights Act and all of that, all of you, I'm sure, remember affirmative action. It kicked in. Affirmative action kicked in. And so the recruiters were coming to the historically black colleges looking for qualified, you know, the best students. And um, I was recruited to come to New Jersey from way down in Alabama. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Woo, Jesus. <laughs> that, uh, let me tell you, I've been through some fearful things in my life. But I, since we've been in this lockdown, God is setting me free. Do you hear me? God is setting me free. God is setting me free. So I, I was recruited to work for Merck. I, I, work, I was an employee there for, retired in 2003 after having been employed there for 34 years in research. It was a great life. God gave me great friends, great favor. And so I, I just bless him. I bless him and I bless Dr. Martin Luther King who had courage. He was, he was the picture of courage, Amen. courage courage and boldness and so I, I just I just thank God and I thank you pastor for allowing me to say something giving you an air hug love you Lord, we just thank you for Easter's life and that she's able to speak into so many of our lives and that the, uh, some things in life are caught and some are taught. We thank you that she did not hold on to her bitterness and she did stake her claim and she did not allow all of the bitterness to rule her life because of Holy Spirit on the inside. So look, church, we're, we're trying to stand for everything that she just talked about. I'm sure we fall short in some places, but it's not because we're not trying. We had a visitor come to 219 Mount Airy before we moved here, and he, his kids were home from college. This was just a couple years ago. And I 
talked to him afterwards and he said his children looked at him. They were home from college, so they know that this whole talk of diversity was you know, high on the list for college kids. And they said to him, unsolicited, this is what every corporation in America is trying to do, get a group of people together that, I di that are diverse in age and color and, and background. And it's not something we ever tried to do. All we ever tried to do is hear from God and not judge people and just make everybody feel welcome here to be part of a family where they can grow into who God called them to be, amen? I'm sure one of the things Easter learned in biology is that everybody's blood is the same color. We all bleed red. So we're gonna be a force for healing, amen?